Hello, everybody. This is Connor. Hey, real quick about this episode. This is another prereq, which is uh, where Dustin and I record segments separately and package it together for you guys. We were unable to meet up this week because we have busy lives and jobs that pay us money and families and loved ones and other things that are more important than you, the viewer. Um, if you'd like to be a part of that loved circle of human beings that Dustin and I hold dear and want to spend time with and do things for, you could go to hoopercastpod.blogspot.com or hoopercastpod.tumblr.com and hit that donate button and donate some money through PayPal to the Hoopercast. And then maybe next time we go, I don't know, I don't, really think, I don't think we can make it work today. Dustin and I will go, you know what though? These people donate to us. I feel like we owe them that. Because right now, we really don't owe you shit. No. Nope, we don't. And we don't care. Doesn't matter. You were here as flies on the wall to Dustin and I just kind of having a conversation about movies and TV and pop culture. And um, we're glad you're here. But if you're going to start making demands, uh, yeah, there's the door. So... I'm just not quite in the mood to pander to you guys. I'm taking a little note from Donald Trump. I'm going to say some things that are a little bit harsh, but if you can just stick with me, I think I'll really surprise you. I shouldn't say that. Don't, don't, I, you know what? I'm nothing like Donald Trump, so uh, just forget I even said that. Anyway, like I said, it's a prereq, so enjoy the episode. Uh, next week, we ought to be meeting together for a regular show. Um, I'm just not going to tease ahead what we're talking about because we don't have anything in particular, really. I think what's coming out this weekend, something's coming out this weekend. It is uh, the Fantastic Four. Um, I can assure you we will not be talking about that as Dustin and I each have little to no interest in it. I may, however, try to find an Armand White review or something like that. Something something fun. I We're going to at least report on how it's doing. But we won't. We will. We will not have seen the film. Um, so, if you're looking for a review of that, um, first of all, what's wrong with you? And second of all, you came to the wrong place. Anyway, hey guys, um, welcome to the Hoopercast. Enjoy. Let Hooper take a turn. Hey, it's Connor again. I'm going to go first this time since um, this is a little bit more recent of an event going on. Uh, Last week on July 31st, um, Netflix uh, put up their their prequel series to Wet Hot American Summer, uh, the 2001 movie, and it's called Wet Hot American Summer, the first day of camp. Um, For those who don't know, I mean, I gave a pretty... Well, probably a pretty lazy history of the film um, in the last episode we did. But um, essentially, uh, director David Wayne and writer, performer, comedian, you know, Michael Showalter, what is he? What would you call him? What would you refer to him as? He's, yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a writer, actor. I say comedian. Well, he is. He's a lot of things. Google has comedian as his primary occupation, but, um, he is a comedian, actor, writer, director. He's all these things. He's a sketch guy. He's a, he's a funny guy. He's a guy who makes funny things and his role in those funny things varies from time to time. Um, so him and David Wayne, you know, wet hot American summer was their thing. And, um, it was, uh, it was, it was a, basically a spoof of like sex comedies, around at the time, but it, it's doing a disservice to, to, to refer to it as merely like a sex comedy spoof because it's not just that it's, I don't know. It is in like a, in like, in what I would like into an airplane style of humor. This just kind of absurdist, like take the jokes pretty far kind of a thing. Um, to the point where the, the, the boundaries of reality, the jokes go far enough to where either people will make logical leaps in their behavior 
for the sake of comedy, you know, it's you're meant to take it at face value at the beginning of a joke, but when you're like several steps into it, you you kind of just have to let go and go with it. Um, so it may not this show and this this prequel show is the same way. It's the same kind of sensibility. I don't have too terribly much to say about it except. I think that uh, it was funny, and it's short. It's eight episodes, and they keep saying it's season one. I don't believe there's going to be a season two. They just they wanted to do a prequel movie for the longest time, um, and then when they were kind of figuring out how to do it, and they figured that they should partner with Netflix and do that, then they decided, you know, we've got – this is going to be like a really long movie, and so they essentially just broke it up into episodes. And uh, the all the adult cast um, – returned um to their original roles and it's which is funny because in the in the original movie in 2001 they're playing like 16 17 year old people and they're all like 32 so they're already um they're already too old to play these roles but the the joke with this time is it's been 15 years for for the actors but they're they're playing that same age group and so it's I think there are people out there who genuinely don't understand that that's part of the joke. There are people who are like, well, how is Amy Poehler going to play a 16 year old girl? She's, she's in her mid forties. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's the joke, man. That's the joke. She's there's, they're, they're like 25 years too old to play these roles, especially Michael Showalter, who since the movie has, he's not like morbidly obese, but he, he aged as you might expect. He just got a little puffier. He's puffier. He's like a stick figure in the, in the movie. And he's about the same build as Jeff Daniels is today, um, who was always, you know, 30 pounds overweight. But, like, so he's coming back, he's playing Cooper again, and he's got that same little, like, that same kind of bully haircut over his ears. He just, it, it honestly, it took me just not knowing Michael Showalter very well. I only knew him from the movie um, off the top of my head. So seeing him again, I kept I, I I recognized everybody else. I recognized Michael Ian Black and Bradley Cooper and Joe, Joe Latrulio and Ken Marino and Zach Orth and Janine Garofalo and Elizabeth Banks and Amy Poehler. I recognized everybody. I just uh, for a while I was like, "This is one of the original cast, but who is he?" And it took me a while, and I thought, "Oh, that was the skinny guy. That's Michael Showalter because he's he, he's aged the most visibly. I mean, everyone else is just kind of." You can just kind of tell, like, they either got crow's feet or whatever. Janine Garofalo looks, I mean, upon seeing comparisons, like, I can tell, obviously, that people have aged. But for the most part, everyone looks pretty much the same. That's not a bad thing, by the way. I'm not saying that because they've aged, they look, ugh. Frankly, I prefer Amy Poehler <laughs> in terms of appearance to now because when she was younger, she was she's just creepier. I don't know how to explain it. She's just creepier. Like, her eyebrows got higher or something. She, I, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. She just scares me. She would play really good. Um, not really, but she, she reminds, she reminds me of kind of like this Harley Quinn kind of ball of energy when she was younger, which is, which was great for sketch, but it always sort of like, if she just sort of stared at you and did like a really wide eyed, like, uh, I'd be like, I'd hate to see her. Like if I was asleep in my, in my room, and um and I and I heard like a twig break in, indoors for some reason. And at the foot of my bed, there was Amy Poehler holding like a flashlight up to her face, like telling a campfire story. I'd probably, I'd probably, I I don't know what I'd do. If she was, if she was just standing there holding the holding the the holding like either just a lighter up to her face or a flashlight, I'd 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 be so afraid. Anyway. No, I'm not saying it's a bad thing that they've aged. It's funny, and it, 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 it's if it was too distracting for you in the movie, you'll you'll never get past it for the show. But the show is just a little prequel series, and and it, for the most part, I don't want to say it's aimless because there was really no stakes in the movie, and I didn't need any because I was just enjoying these these little. I was just watching, enjoying watching these characters interact, um, and I enjoy it the same this way. It's just a little bit of a. Um, you know, like you're you're essentially just watching how certain things in the movie came to be. Like Brad, how, like you know, Bradley Cooper is, you know, he, he he's he's in the movie and he's like a theater guy. And then like at a certain point, you see him and Michael Ian Black, like you know, making out in this like shed together. 
And so you're like, okay, so he's gay. I mean, I guess that was a little bit of a twist from the beginning of this movie, but this kind of gives you more backstory into like how they met and why they like each other. And it's not some grand like opus of, of groundbreaking character development or whatever, but it's just, it's just fun to watch. I've already, I've probably talked about it too long as it is. It's just fun to watch. And so it's not for everybody. I mean, Mrs. Hooper doesn't like it. My wife doesn't like it. You know, she, she tried to watch the movie and she doesn't like that kind of humor. I think she's more, she, she prefers, she prefers more trendy references to current things. And, um, I don't know, more of tradition, the tra- traditional comedy structure. This is a little bit more, not even dry, but it's just a lot more sketch based or visual or just some of it's just unexplained humor. I don't really, I'd call it absurdist, but I don't know. Comedy is comedy. It just made me laugh. It made me laugh. The sensibilities made me laugh. I understood what it was going for. And so once I sort of understood what kind of comedy it was, then I adjusted my sales. I was like, okay, so I'm not looking for like, you know, this isn't a Jim Carrey movie. Like I'm not, he's not going to be doing these bombastic, like these faces or these pratfalls or whatever. I'm watching, I'm just watching more subtle and weird kind of humor. And that's cool with me personally. So if you have not caught this, it's on Netflix right now. Go watch it. The movie's on Netflix too. And so is the documentary. And it's called like a hurricane of something, hurricane of fun. And I got to be honest, I haven't watched all of it. <clears throat> I tried to watch some of it last night and I was just really tired. I picked the wrong time of day to try and watch a documentary. It's pretty short though. It's like an hour. And it was uh, behind the scenes stuff of the of the movie. And it's just, you're just watching, just watching actors kind of goof around in between takes. And you saw that when they were shooting the movie, they were like living up at the camp. It was, it was basically like being at camp. Um, so it's just an interesting little documentary. So if you if you're into this, if you liked the movie and um and you watch the show and you enjoy the show, check out that documentary. It's it it probably adds a little layer of specialness to it because you know, just like any kind of independent or small or low budget movie, there's a especially with with actors who really get along, and got to know each other and really clicked together, there's like a little a little bit of specialness to it. You know, actors get that way already. I mean, I've, I've, my, my wife was a theater major, and I saw it with act with theater actors, especially like you're all together doing this thing, and you're, you know, you're like a little family, and you've shared this experience, and so it's kind of nice to peek peek at that a little bit whenever you can, um, especially because most of these actors, as I said in the last episode, they went on to do bigger things, you know, um, which is why doing this thing now is so special because they're all so famous and so busy that their schedules are so hard to wrangle. I mean, I read that Bradley Cooper um, had to shoot all his stuff for this prequel series in one day because he's just so busy. Um, He's got other shit going on, you know? Um, So does everyone else, but that's just one example. I mean, so um, it's kind of cool to, to go back and see like, wow, I recognize him. I recognize him. I recognize him. Like I, that guy's in a lot of Judd Apatow movies and there's this and blah, blah, blah. So I recommend it. Um, I've talked long enough about it. So I'm going to kick it over to Dustin now, who's going to talk about inside out. Um, so yeah, and I'll see you guys at the end of the episode for some brief housekeeping and maybe peeking ahead at a couple more things. Goodbye, my friends. I love you. Oh. Dustin, where are you? Hello, everybody. Dustin here. Um, I'm bringing you today a review of Disney Pixar's Inside Out. This movie is still in theaters, and I'm a little bit behind on doing a review for it, but I did see it opening weekend um, and had a really, really good time with it. Um, I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of an overview uh, of the film and then what I thought of it. So let's jump in. Um, Basically, the film is about uh, a little girl named Riley, and her parents have decided that it is time for a move. And so she's leaving her friends behind and her school behind, and as it does, it has an effect on her subconscious. And the film is played out uh, mostly in her mind. 
by these little characters who represent different emotions that she's feeling. Um, so the film's characters, the main characters of the film are the personification of these, these emotions. Um, so it's led by joy. There's also sadness and anger, disgust and fear. And these characters are all super defined by what they are, by their name. Um, and, um, they go on this quest to restore Riley back to her old self because the move has kind of jumbled some stuff up in her mind. Um, it's kind of an abstract little idea, but it's something that in a way is really simple and um, is a really great way to start conversation, probably especially with kids in terms of you know the way that their emotions are affecting their behavior. Um, it's a super awesome piece. Um, it's Disney Pixar, so you know that uh, story-wise, it's pretty solid. It's grounded out by some really great performances by Amy Poehler, uh, Phyllis Smith, who you may know from The Office, uh, Mindy Kaling, also from The Office, um, Bill Hader, and uh, shoot, I should have had that pulled up. Hold on. Who's that last guy? Hold on. It's coming to me. Ah, okay. It's Lewis Black. So these characters all um, interact with each other very well, and um, and the actors have some really great material when playing off of each other. Um, they are all superbly cast, and they are just super fun to watch, which is really what matters in a kids' movie like this. Um, but don't let me calling it a kids' movie kind of burden your mind because it's really not. Um, there's some adult situations in terms of um, at various points you see inside her parents' minds. Um, and it's there's one scene around a dinner table that's just super funny um, because you get to see the way that different people allow different emotions to sort of run their lives, um, whether it be joy or sadness or, or disgust even. And um, – and there's a great little tag at the end that has to do with that as well. Um, but yeah, the film is funny. The film is heartfelt. Um, it's a movie that doesn't feel like it's super long. It doesn't feel like it's super short. It's just the perfect amount of time to tell the story that it tells, um, which is really saying something because that's a hard thing to know. But I never felt like the movie really – was bogged down in story or, you know, had filler moments. Um, and like I said, that's just a really hard thing to do. And, uh, this film is just kind of perfectly paced. Um, the movie, uh, if I had to pick some negatives, um, maybe the first thing I would say would be, uh, the first act is weighed down a little bit, maybe by exposition, right? They have to set up the world of the internal, you know, mind of Riley, um, the way that it works with core memories and the, uh, control panel where the emotions can, you know, affect her. Um, all of these things take a little bit of time to set up. There's these little places called islands of personality. It's things like family, you know, this is very important to her. So a lot of her emotions and a lot of her memories reside here in, um, you know, family island or hockey island or whatever the case may be. Um, I think there's a goofball island. So it's these little key aspects of her character, and all of that has to be explained. So the first little bit of the film is a little exposition-y. So if you are just one of those people that's really averse to exposition, you might kind of be a little put off by that first act. But I don't think, you know, for me, I don't really have much of a problem with exposition. As long as it's necessary, I mean, if it's stupid, like, exposition in the third act, then I'm like, okay, now you're just trying to, you know, waste my time. I'm looking at you, Inception. But the exposition here is warranted, it is needed, and it does all sort of happen in the first act. So once you understand that first act, the rest plays off of what they've discovered. Um, of course, they'll discover new things on their journey, sort of like uh, Dorothy does in Oz, right? She'll come across um, a, a new environment with new characters, 
but the world of Oz is very, you know, established in that, in the first act. Um, and so it doesn't feel jarring. And it's the same way here. Although there are new things that are being introduced as they approach them on their journey, it's not like exposition. I, I don't, I don't feel that it's expositiony. Um, but basically the film, like I said, kids will love it because it's bright and it's colorful and it's fun and it's funny. Adults will love it because you can kind of see these things through your eyes, right? And through the eyes of your children or through kids that you know, and you can see how everybody's kind of got one emotion that comes out most prevalently and it's really cool to kind of walk away from and and not that you as an adult will say, I've got these little things in my head, but it's cool to to be able to be introspective after the film and say, okay, this is an emotion that, you know, is caused by, you know, and we know that it's, you know, neurons and all of these things firing in your brain, but it's kind of nice to give a little face to them and a little story to them. Um, so you will you will enjoy the fact that you can understand the conflict of emotions better than maybe a child would. Um, so as the child is going to say, this is fun and funny, you're going to say, this actually has a little bit to say about the way that we approach life and the way that we deal with situations that come about. And um, yeah, it's a super fun little movie and uh, it is still in theaters, at least around – my place. So, uh, if you are just slacking a little bit and, and are kind of on the fence about whether or not to go see it, go see it. I mean, it's fun. It's Disney Pixar. It's an original idea. Um, go check it out. It's, it is fun. It is funny. And, uh, I think you'll have a good time. Um, on a side note, I think the last time that I cried laughing in a movie was probably 22 Jump Street, and Inside Out made me cry laughing. Um, it's just th that dinner table scene I told you about, the tag, these things are just phenomenally funny. And I don't know who is responsible for these these scenes in particular because I know Pixar kind of uses their little brain trust to, to flesh out their stories a little bit, but, man, it's just it's a phenomenal sequence. Um yeah, it, it, like I said, it's super funny. You'll have a good time, and uh, if you are interested, definitely go see it. Definitely give it a shot. So yeah, that's Inside Out by Disney Pixar, um, a Pete Doctor film. And uh, yeah, man, just uh, you know, I'm gonna pass it back off to you, Hoop, and uh, you know, thank you all for listening. Thanks, Dustin. Before we go, I just want to take a peek ahead into what's in theaters now. Um, Currently, um, doing pretty well still. Um, Ant Man, it's got an eighty percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, Mission Impossible: Rogue Nation's got a ninety-three, so um, that seems like it's doing pretty well. So most of you probably already seen that. Um, doing pretty well. On the other hand, um, what's no? Oh, and, oh, sorry, Trainwreck. Trainwreck's doing pretty well too at eighty-six still. So those are all previously in theaters. As well as was um, Pixels, which is sitting at uh, 18%, and Vacation at 25%. Um, but what's opening <clears throat> this weekend, um, what is The Gift? I'm sorry, I don't know that much about it. What is The Gift? I don't know what that is, but it's doing well. It's got like a 90, what did that have? That had something. That had a 91 on Rotten Tomatoes. I don't know what Shaun and the Sheep is, but that's got a 99%, so go see that. Apparently, lots of people like it. And as I said, uh, Fantastic Four opening this weekend in theaters, in theaters now. And it's got a 9%. So I'll just go ahead and say I don't recommend that. Having, looking at that score, 9%, no matter what your sensibilities tend to... I don't know a lot of movies I've seen that I really love and watch over and over again that have less than 40% on Rotten Tomatoes, probably. Except for Smoke and Aces. You know what, though? Let's see. I bet you Smoking Aces has over 40. Oh, it does not. It has a 29. Okay, well, so there's that. And uh, Diablo Cody's new movie, Ricky and the Flash, got 57. Um, What kind of movie is that, though? If it's a, com if it's a comedy, it's, it's... Who knows? You may not want to go see Ricky and the Flash. But 
it's in theaters, so uh, maybe you do. Maybe you like Diablo Cody. Don't know. What I'm kind of excited for, I don't know if I'll be able to see it. This will not be opening this weekend, but uh, next weekend, August 14th, straight out of Compton, um, opens. And right now, the early reviews, it's got a 91%. I think we all knew that this was going to be pretty well done, but uh, the buzz for this film is pretty good. So I think everyone's already really excited about that one. So hopefully when that comes out, it'll do well and uh, get the praise that it seems like it deserves. Anyway, um, thanks for listening, you guys. I already mentioned Tumblr and Blogger, so you can catch us on iTunes. Just search HooperCast. You can subscribe to us. Write us a five-star review. Even if you just say good podcast or anything like that. you know, If you like the show, give us a good review. Maybe we can get some recognition, get more people who will also think that the show is good. Um, you can find us on YouTube, previous episodes. I'm doing a really bad job of updating the current ones, but there's a lot of previous ones on the YouTube page, Hoopercast Pod on YouTube, or you can follow us on Twitter at Hoopercast, Facebook.com slash Hoopercast, and um, of course on Podbean, our, our host, um, HoopercastPod.Podbean.com, and um, that's right. So, uh, until next time, that was Dustin back there. I'm Connor right here. We'll see you guys later. Let Hooper take a turn. Hooper drives the boat, Chief. <laughs>